During my last live stream on Blog TV, I mentioned that my live streaming activities would be taking an indefinite hiatus. Now, it was originally my goal to use that time to clean up the studio. As over time, the studio has been added to and modified quite a bit, and oftentimes these modifications were done without much regard for neatness or maintainability. And as such, the studio has definitely turned into something of a spaghetti mess. In my traditional style, however, I have managed to get essentially nothing done since the time of my last ever live stream over on Blog TV. Now, I've heard it said that when you have a big job like neatening up this studio would be, that you're supposed to do the least pleasant and most difficult tasks first. Well, I never was very good at that. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do today is a little bit of maintenance and upgrade work on this Dell Dimension 2300 that is my music player computer and has been for all of the time that I have spent on Blog TV, at least since I graduated past using just a turntable and a CD player. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story of this machine, it was actually something that I picked up off the curb. And despite the fact that this little Dell Dimension 2300 owes me absolutely nothing, it has been an incredibly reliable little machine over the years, especially when you consider that I have put absolutely no money into it over time. This computer's reliability and performance only become more impressive when you consider the seriously limited hardware with which it is equipped to perform the tasks asked of it. Dell's Dimension 2300, of course, began life as a computer targeted toward the budget-conscious and value-oriented segment of the market, so it was never a high-end computer, even when it was new. And in fact, I was more than a little surprised when I picked this machine up to see that it was equipped with a real Intel Pentium 4 microprocessor. Now, this thing's microprocessor is not high-end. In fact, I believe that it's one of the earliest Socket 478 Pentium 4 CPUs that you could buy, clocked at around 2 gigabytes megahertz even with a 400 megahertz front side bus speed. This machine only has 512 megabytes of memory and unlike the later Dimension 2350 and 2400, this machine is actually using PC 133 SD RAM as opposed to the later double data rate or DDR memory used in other Pentium 4 machines. That also serves to hamper its performance, and yet, despite the fact that I often had at least one copy of iTunes running on this machine, several instances of Windows Media Player 6.4, and oftentimes a web browser up to handle the delivery of the stereo dust particles ads, only rarely did this machine ever skip a beat. Usually if I would bring up Audacity and ask it to perform some kind of an effect on an advertisement, that was asking a little bit much of this machine, and it would make the audio stutter, but otherwise its performance was flawless. And that's why I feel it has certainly earned the right to be upgraded. The first upgrade that I have in mind for this machine, and the one that I'll be discussing in this particular video, is that of random access memory. I don't recall how much RAM this machine had in it when I picked it up off the curb. I only remember running to my junk box and grabbing two of the largest PC-133 SD RAM modules I could find. At the time, those were two 256 megabyte Kingston value RAM modules. I would not be at all surprised to find if I were to plug this machine's service tag into the Dell website that it was initially equipped with just 128 or even 256 megabytes of memory as that was a very common tactic used by Dell to drive the price of these machines down even further. These were some of the first computers to break or reach the $300 price point. Unfortunately, their lack of installed memory probably sent many of them to an untimely retirement in an electronics recycling center, or worse than that, a landfill. What I have here are two 512 megabyte PC-133 modules acquired for just $12 shipped by virtue of the fact that Time, eBay, and sellers in China all conspire to make things very cheap. I don't know how good these modules actually are. The seller in China said that I would receive a name brand memory module. You can see that there is no name brand module manufacturer or identifying information on the specification sticker, but you can see that the chips on the module were marked as being made by Hynix. I hope that they're real. I 
I'm going to be an optimist and assume that they are. So let's go ahead and pop the cover on this computer and take a look at what's inside there right now and just see how clean things are. There's the power supply that I replaced back many months ago along with a little bit of uh, grafted in wiring that is concealed from view underneath this uh, CPU cooling baffle. You can also see that I had to install a replacement fan in this machine. And then here are the two PC-133 memory modules inside the computer. And I'm amazed, given how dusty this old house is, just how clean this machine is inside. But looking around inside it, unfortunately, I see some trouble. I'm looking at these capacitors right here on the motherboard, and as you may be able to see, it looks like that one has started to vent. The top is slightly bulged, and it appears that there's some kind of crud on top of it, which just brushed off. It looks like maybe this one down here is starting to do the same thing as well. And let's see, are there any other bad capacitors on the board? Take a look around. I'm a little surprised the CR2032 seems to be the original battery. I, I figured I would have had to have replaced that. Here you can see another uh, difference between the Dimension 2300 and the later 2350 and 2400, and that is the inclusion of four PCI slots instead of a useless AGP artifact. Of course, it's kind of a break-even game, because although Dell was clearly thinking about it and the artifacts are right there on the motherboard for it, this machine has no onboard Ethernet, making it one of the last computers for which the use of an outboard PCI Ethernet expansion card is a requirement. But going back to the bad capacitors, wait for the camera to focus here. It looks like there's probably another one right there in that trio. It's the one that's dead center, and it looks like it's just started to vent the tiniest amount of electrolyte. It also seems that there's another capacitor here between the PCI slots, two and um, three and two. Yeah, I've got it right. That also appears to be distressed. So this is well, this is kind of sad news. I mean, it's only an inanimate object. It's only a computer and a computer that I paid nothing for at that. But I'd hate to think that capacitor plague is going to be the end of this thing, especially since it seems to work fine otherwise. Well, it's working fine for now. I'll think about replacing the capacitors later. Have to see if I'm devoted enough to make this thing live to die another day. <laughs> of course, I gotta get these open first. I don't know, should I admit to having used my teeth to do that? I think that's something that uh, most people who work on computers do, much to the chagrin of their dentists. Now, let's go ahead and see here. Put the first module in. Click it into place, go and get the second one here. Open it up. This is live computer upgrading. Well, it's taped live computer upgrading with UXW Bill, and during which you find out what a total Slobovian I am when it comes to doing things like this and just how low my standards really are. <laughs> There we go. Both modules are latched in place. Now this is one of those machines that when it began life, it actually had a lower ceiling on the amount of maximum installed memory than it did later in life when higher capacity memory modules were developed. The Intel 845 Northbridge used in this thing was capable of handling memory modules that didn't exist when it was manufactured. And so Dell initially stated that this machine had a memory ceiling of one gigabyte, but if you flashed it to the latest Dell BIOS, you could install two gigabytes worth of memory if you were willing to spend the big dollar on what is otherwise a fairly hampered system. The use of PC-133 SD RAM really unfortunately limits this machine's potential and ultimate performance. But enough of that, let's go ahead and slap the side cover back on it here. See if I can do this single-handed. Hook up a monitor to it and see if it boots. Okay, everybody, here we go. It's time for the unvarnished, honest-to-goodness results of this machine's first power-up after the upgrade. Now, headphone users, I've got to give you a bit of a warning here. I'm going to indulge myself in some silly behavior, so you might want to turn the volume down accordingly here in just a moment. Three, two, one. Smoke test! <laughs> Oh, that'll probably earn me a lot of friends here at nearly 1.30 in the morning. 
I don't recall the exact keystroke to get into this machine setup utility, but it looks like I made it amongst F1, F2, and the delete key. Here we are with the system's time and date. The BIOS version, I should check to see whether or not that is the latest release, especially since the next upgrade I have in mind for this thing is a faster microprocessor. I believe it should be no problem to go up to oh, a 2.8 gigahertz processor or so with a 533 megahertz front side bus. We have 512 kilobytes of uh, processor resident cache, the service tag, and then the number that we care the most about the memory upgrade and it would appear at least so far that instead of doing something spiteful that this machine is actually grateful for the upgrade it's received though we should certainly steal a look in the event log and just see if anything interesting is going on in there I haven't looked at this in quite a long time but it doesn't appear to have logged too many items over the course of its entire history although the dates on the first three entries are definitely what I would call dubious. However, the last one is definitely right on. Here we are at, um, well, it's actually uh, 1.13, I think, in the morning. <laughs> and it says that the memory size has changed. So with that done, I guess it's time to go ahead and see if this machine will actually boot into its operating system. So I'll go ahead and save the changes and then just wait for Windows to start up here. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> Never lose that optimism, kids. Wow, it is taking a good long time to boot. <laughs> Probably got to count through all that memory and make sure it's really there. Make sure that I'm not trying to play some kind of a nasty trick on it. But I'm not the kind of person to do a thing like that. Let's just see what it is up to. Yep, it's counting through the memory. <laughs> I figured as much. There you can see the PC-133 timing. And here comes Windows XP. And here we are at the Windows XP desktop. Now I'm a little bit limited in what I desire to do. I mean, I can run the machine exclusively through the keyboard, but as it happens, I forgot to connect my handy dandy mouse over there. So I reckon the most expedient thing to do is just to go ahead, shut the machine down, and go find my Memtest 86 bootable CD, at which point I'll let this thing run laps on it throughout the night just to verify that it is in fact reliable. The reactions that I get whenever a box of floppy disk etch shows up in one of my videos are always amusing. Some people are downright incredulous, others are mesmerized, and still others ask, do you really use those things? Well, of course I do! Real computers, even value-oriented computers such as this one, have floppy drives and PS2 ports. Though it seems like the floppy drive on this machine may have had a few adventures in its time, so I really don't know if it works. I would presume that it does. Probably tested it not long after bringing it home. But we'll find out here in just a moment. Looks like it's going to work. And there we go. Thank you for watching and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.